trying to do this without Pruitt. I just don't know. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, it's too hard. I can't do it. Yeah. I, you got. You got anything for me? You got yeah, anything? Yeah. So I had. I had a couple of ideas. Okay. For yeah. The intro. Yeah. Um. You ready? Ready. Yeah. Okay. Fitz ban it. All Fitz use it. I, I, that's bad. Uh, you know, maybe Pruitt could have pulled it off, but I don't. I don't. I don't think so. No, that's not. I don't think that's yeah, gonna work for me. I mean, it's it's a pretty minor pun. I, yeah, I just you know I'm not, I, yeah I, 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 okay. you know okay, okay. come on I come on one. what else got what else got come on. My cloaca hasn't been this moist since the how to use your dragons video. No, that was only funny once, and, and besides, I don't have the toys it's to play hilarious. with. You no, know I need the toys to play with to get in. The, okay. No, 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 no. No. I don't repeat jokes. No. Okay, then what do you, what do you want to do for the intro? I, I I just want to talk about this book I like. This episode is brought to you by Plane Breaker, a new supplement for planar adventuring by Monty Cook Games. This is a big deal. You could say Monty and the other designers at MCG set the standard for planar adventures when they worked on D&D during 2nd and 3rd edition. And now they're writing a new book for 5e with brand new planes, monsters, and player options as the Plane Breaker traverses the multiverse. This Kickstarter is live now and blowing through stretch goals. They've got a planar bestiary, minis, and more. Don't miss this one link in the description yeah hey uh this is the show welcome to web dm i'm jim davis and uh we got a new format we're gonna be talking about fizzman's treasury of dragons today um but if you'd like to hear more i don't know looser longer form uh back and forth uh discussion about it we've got web dm talks available on pretty much all the major podcasting uh platforms and uh yeah i'm there with our ceo emma talking about uh, the book what we liked didn't like dragons that kind of thing um, but uh, for today's video, we're going to dive into uh, this new book from Wizards of the Coast, what I liked about it, what I think some of the missed opportunities are, and how I would have changed them, and then how I would uh, incorporate the elements of this book into my own games. So, um, yeah. All right, so let's start off. Chapter breakdown, there's a lot in this book, and there's a little bit for players, but it's mostly for DMs. First introductory chapter, it's got a lot of the lore stuff that links the uh, omniplanar essence of dragons to the multi-verse uh, of material planes that I think is really cool. And then in chapter one, we move on to the character creation options. There's some stuff there, a couple of subclasses, feats and the like. Um, and then the rest of the player's options are in chapter uh, two, which is the dragon magic. There's some good stuff there, magic items, horde items, things like that. Then the rest of the book is for DMs. We have a playing dragons chapter where it's like, all sorts of tips and tables and tools for running your dragons as NPCs, fleshing out their layers, their motivations, who their followers are, how to use them in a campaign, that kind of thing. Then we get into a chapter about uh, layers and hordes and how to like flesh out what the layer is and really like bring the horde to life so that it's not just a big pile of treasure, but becomes something magical in and of itself. Um, chapter five is the Draconomicon which is like covers 20 different types of dragons, all sorts of tables for how to customize their personalities, their appearance, what sort of followers they might have. It's a perfect GM toolkit. And then at last but not least, chapter six is the bestiary. We get all sorts of different kinds of creatures, including mythic versions of Bahamut, Tiamut, the great worm dragons, as well as some uh, lower level monsters for everybody to enjoy. All right, so here we go. This is the rest of the video. It's a new format, we're trying something different. So uh, yeah, what I really liked about Fizzbins was that it takes something familiar about D&D, &D, which is dragons. And for me personally, dragons have become very blah, blase. I really use them a lot in my campaigns. And in the times that I've been a player, uh, I've been less than impressed with uh, you know, how dragons come across um, you know, in that sense. And Fizzman's does something that's like, it's trying to take that kind of dragon, right? The, the typical dragon encounter of like, well, we all jumped on it and then around half the tip points were gone. And it really wasn't this majestic kind of beast, this, this you know, mythic monster or whatever. And Fizzman goes like, well, what if we try to remystify it? And that's what I liked about Fizzman's. It is so conceptually dense with new ideas and ways to see dragons and like tie them into the world, to the cosmos, into your setting at various levels, not just like at the big picture level, but also the local level. That was like, 
reignited a passion for what this kind of monster is this this creature of mythology that is more than just a bag of hit points that breathes out some elemental damage and is like a part of the magical nature of the world itself and that's i think my favorite part about fizzman's is this the conceptual density of it like i, I couldn't stop like <laughs> pulling myself back from all the different tangents that i'd go as i read through it and then it couples this, uh, you know, just rich, imaginative uh, uh, churning that it's got with incredibly useful tables and tools for dungeon masters to then create dragons that are multifaceted, have motivations and goals that are interesting and compel play. And then also have layers that are unique and different so that no two red dragons in your campaign world are alike. Or that there's a substantive difference between the different types of dragons, however you choose to break them down. And so those two things alone make Fizzman's one of my favorite 5e books, like, I, I, uh, of a while, right? I can't really think of others that come too much closer, maybe uh, Ghosts of Saltmarsh, uh, that I was that impressed by. And then it adds something new to the lore, which I think is the third thing that I really liked about Fizzman's, is that it says, like, all right, D&D has often had this fuzzy relationship with what the creation of the material uh, plane is. We have a good idea of what the outer planes are, right? These conceptual realms that organize themselves around various alignment groupings. We know what the inner planes are like, the stuff of reality, the raw elements. And then the material plane is, eh, it's where your campaign happens and who cares about it, right? It's just like home. But that's not true. D&D is a magical world fractally from the smallest bit to the highest bit. And that means the material plane is magical. And in the same way that we've got celestials for the upper planes, we've got fiends for the lower planes, we've got elementals for the inner planes, dragons are what tie that sort of magical nature to the material plane. They, dragons embody that magic. They are tied to specific locations. They have layers that are in specific geographic locations. They're tied to the magic of the world that, that binds this whole thing together. The whole reason that druids can do magic, that wizards know how to do magic, that that power that exists in the world, dragons are just of it, of the physical embodiment of it in the land. And that is awesome. And you couple that with the fact there's this first world that Bama and Tiamat created it, that their offspring were some of the first dragons, and then the outsiders, the gods, and their sponsored humanoid creations come in and mess the whole thing up. I think it's such a, a, a fresh and new addition to D&D lore that it's like, I, how, how has it taken us five editions to find a place for dragons in this, in this cosmology? And I really think it works. They really sell it. And then they also make it really gameable in the fact that the more dragons understand about this uh, omniplanar existence of theirs, the fact that there was one material world and now it's been shattered and they exist as separate echoes on each one of those, the more powerful they get ties the D&D worlds of the material plane together in a way that I find more compelling than the other attempts to do that, whether it's Luminous Phlogiston or a portal network or whatever. But this idea that powerful enough souls share this connection, I find really gameable, really interesting, and I think is a fresh addition to D&D lore. I'm glad you guys have made it this far into the video. Here we are. If you love what we're doing, if you like the channel, if you like what we're up to, then you can go ahead and sponsor us over on Patreon. We've got like more than 200 podcast episodes. Emma pops up on the podcast over there a lot. So if you like her, you get a chance to, uh, to listen to her stuff more too. I ramble a whole lot more over there. So if you like that kind of thing, you want to support us, come and check us out on Patreon. All right. So that's what I liked. Here's what I think could have been better. For one, there's really not many player options in Fizzman's. And when you compare it to like prior editions, Draconomicons with like Dragon Rider this and Dragon Speaker that and Dragon Knight this, it, it, it felt a little sparse. Yep, we have the Drake Warden and they'll end up riding their dragon to awesome adventures. And there's the Way of the Ascendant Monk, which is like clearly a monk archetype that needs to exist. And the options that are there are interesting. The magic items are cool, but like post Tasha's, I'd kind of expect to see variant class features listed here. Maybe an update on the Dragon Soul Sorcerer. Advice on how to turn a Fiend Pact Warlock into a Dragon Pact Warlock. Something like that. I don't need full-blown subclasses, but something more for players would have been nicer to see. And I, like I said, what's there is really cool, but a little sparse on the ground. 
Now, I've spent years talking about how much uh, DMs need more support and love, so it seems weird to say that there needs to be more players' options, but dragons are for everybody. Part of the fun of them is that the players get to experience the draconic side of it through magic and character options and the like, while the DM gets these intricate monsters that work as NPCs and big villains and movers and shakers. So it'd been nicer to see some more for players. One of the other things is that as beautiful as a toolkit this, as this is, as awesome as it is to read through and look at the options and see all the possibilities that can come from the tables, there's this weird spot in chapter three when it comes to dragon encounters. It starts us off with four questions that we should ask ourselves when we include a dragon. Very useful. Is the dragon the focus of play or merely an obstacle to get past? Are they in their lair or not? Do they have minions or not? What's the purpose of this encounter? Is it to just show off a bit of the world or is this supposed to be a white knuckle fight? And then there's a table of complications, which every one of the 20 entries of it is awesome, packed full of goodness. Many of them have multiple ideas in them that are workable and gameable. But then there's nothing else. There's no advice for new DMs on how to run these complex monsters in a way that doesn't end up in a anticlimactic fight. Or how a dragon might approach a adventuring party encroaching in their territory. What are the steps that they might take to try to stop the adventurers from getting too close to their lair? Things that a DM can use to build upon themselves so that the encounter with the dragon isn't just a, a one-shot anticlimactic eh, wet blanket, but it's more of an extended series of sessions in which the players are probing into the dragon's territory, dealing with the minions, playing a game of move and counter move as they hone in closer on this monster's lair. It would, not, it would have been nicer to see some more there. And it's a, sort of a dim spot in an otherwise brilliant chapter full of amazing DM tools. And lastly, I found the mythics a little underwhelming. When I compared the aspect of Tiamat to the Tiamat from the end of uh, the, the once called thing, the one and the, Finally, I found the mythics underwhelming. I've done a lot of design work in the last year freelance, and most of it has been towards high CR monsters. They're complex creatures, difficult for DMs to run, and there's a very fine balance that needs to be struck between awe-inspiring, unique, and not a, huge <laughs> not a huge pain in the ass to run. And so I can see where they're going with having a simplified monster in the mythic format, but it felt underwhelming. At the end of Rise of Tiamat, you have a chance to fight an aspect of Tiamat herself, or possibly even Tiamat according to the adventure. And this is a brutal fight. She can do something like 300 points of damage around, at least two breath weapons. It's absolutely brutal. Fits a CR 30. And I felt like, compared to that, the mythics in Fizbins were a little underwhelming. What I really liked, though, were the lower-end creatures. Draco Hydra, the Draconians, all of them were very flavorful, interesting abilities. Something new to bring to the table, and something that's going to make for a really memorable fight. But, even as I say that, the aspect of Bahamut, the, one of the other uh, mythic creatures, has a breath weapon that resurrects the dead. Which I just can't stop thinking about the applications of that and how you would use that in a high-level campaign, you know, of some epic battle and you need your left flank uh, reinforced. You have to call in the aspect of Bahamut. So even though I found it a little underwhelming, there's still good stuff there, still plenty to use, and they're simple, so they're going to be easier for new DMs to use, get a handle on, build something more to their liking. We got the list stuff out of the way. We got the good stuff. We got the bad stuff. Here's what I plan to take away and use for, uh, from this book. <clears throat> I'm going to start that because I feel weird. Here's how I would use Fizbin's Treasury of Dragons. Number one, lore incorporation. This idea of, of dragons creating the first world and of gods coming in from the outside and, and that war fracturing it and creating the multiverse. I love that idea. It fits well with some of my own creation myths that I have for my own setting, so it's gonna be easy for me to incorporate. What I'm really excited about is the, idea, is the idea of omniplanar beings, of these creatures that exist on multiple planes at the same time simultaneously and are potentially in connection with each other. The idea that some mortals might have a, a bit of that omniplanar essence to their soul as well, I find interesting. And is a really cool way to incorporate sort of the increase in power that a character has as they gain in levels and reconciling that with a more grounded uh, reality, sort of low level D&D. How is it that they can fall off cliffs or be riddled with arrows? Perhaps they're absorbing some of their uh, cross planar essences as well in that uh, rise through power. So I really like that idea. Definitely gonna incorporate it. I'm also thinking of a campaign frame. 
I found that the uh, the lifespan section of the uh, Dragons in Play just like absolutely set my brain on fire with ideas. And it was a section I was anticipating being like, oh great, we're gonna have like a biology text version of what a dragon's life li cycle is like. No, nothing like that. It is instead an, uh, a just a, a sampling of like how these creatures from the moment that they are hatched begin to affect the world around them, begin to interact with the world. They immediately start feeding and collecting treasure to create a lair for themselves because that's gonna create a harmonic resonance for their draconic magic that allows them to become powerful and strong. And you think about it, it's like, okay, this takes place over the course of centuries. It takes, you know, a hundred years for a wormling or a young dragon to become an adult. And like how that must impact the development of civilizations. So the idea comes to me of a campaign frame where the setup of the campaign world is that in the prior age, dragons are these majestic creatures that, that you only revered from afar, those skyscraper-sized brutes that are near godlike in their awe. And then they all died. Nobody really knows what happened. The empires of the world grew decadent and moribund. And now, hungry at the fringes, are younger peoples who have at their beck and call thousands of young dragons, wormlings and the like, who are hungry for a horde of their own, to establish their own lairs and their own empires. And that's the backdrop for what would essentially be a sandbox campaign of the players dealing with that if they want, or trying to get out of the way of it, or just living their lives with that going on in the background. Finally, one of the ways I want to use the book is as a resource for tier three and four NPCs. You see, dragons make perfect power brokers and sages and keepers of lost relics and the like, cosmic powers in their own right for that level of play of D&D. Because they're grounded in the material plane, it keeps the whole campaign grounded in where it started so that you get to retread ground and you have to don't worry too much about going out into the plains, says the one who actually loves planes. But by keeping it grounded in the material plane, you keep that connection going. What the places that they visited at first level, they can go back to. And dragons help with that. They become powerful brokers. They become worthy of tier three and four PCs as adversaries and allies and the like without needing to cross the plains and therefore leave home. And so it kind of has a quality that like uh, keeps a campaign grounded and uh, familiar for a campaign. And Fizzman's is full of great advice for how to build those types of NPCs. Hey everybody, hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, if you did, like, subscribe, leave us a comment, help us appease the algorithm gods. If you want more of WebDM, you can find our podcast, WebDM Talks, on all major podcast platforms. And if you want to support us, help keep the channel going, and join our WebDM Patreon. We've got a ton of stuff you can check out. We're also writing a book, which you can pre-order from the link below. See you guys next week. All right, so you made it this far into the video. Check it out. We have a Patreon. You gotta come and check it out. We've got a lot of other things you can check out, and I'm gonna mention that you should check it out several other times before I'm finished with the CTA, where I want you to check things out. We have a lot of podcast episodes for you to check out. We sometimes interview people that are worth checking out. So I hope you go hop on over to our Patreon and check it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs>